Fallout's Wasteland is home to many people from all walks of life. Wastelanders as they are known have adopted the torn and ruined landscape that was once pre-war America and have now called it home. Through blood, sweat, tears, and loss, these folks have created some form of civilization from what was thought to have been lost. But not all from the past has been forgotten, no. You see, there are people from a society long gone that have had their legacy live on. These are five of the most influential pre-war characters in Fallout. The first person on this list makes the most recent appearance in the Fallout games, and that is Nuka-Cola founder and CEO, John Caleb Bradburton. Nuka-Cola, as a brand and beverage, is featured prominently throughout every wasteland. Everywhere one goes, except for maybe Far Harbor, you're never too far from the refreshing taste of a cold Nuka-Cola. But how did this come to be? Why exactly does Bradburton's beverage appear to be everywhere? Well, it's kind of a funny story, depending on your definition of funny, of course. You see, John Caleb Bradburton was nothing more than a budding chemist when he came up with the idea of creating a new soft drink in 2042. He saw a gap in the market for fizzy, sugary drinks, and he was determined to fill it. It would take nearly two years before Bradburton was satisfied with his new concoction. It was in late 2044 that the chemist's new and refined soda first made it onto the shelves of pre-war America. Nuka-Cola was born. The rise of Nuka-Cola was an extremely rapid one. Within a year of the beverage's launch, it was already available on store shelves nationwide, quickly becoming the most popular soft drink out there. And standing alongside Nuka-Cola's rise was its creator, John Caleb Bradburton, always striving to improve. The man's drive would lead to a wide number of flavor combinations and experiments. Grape, cranberry, cherry orange, wild victory, dark quantum quartz, and pretty much whichever flavor Nuka-Cola released next was sure to be a hit. And while pre-war Americans were aware of Nuka-Cola's notoriety, what nobody knew was that the innocuous cola would change post-war society forever. The legacy of John Caleb Bradburton's work can be seen from the hub on the west coast all the way to the White Spring Resort on the east. Nearly everywhere a wastelander may wander, one will also see vendors and merchants trading goods and services for some amount of, usually new Coca-Cola, bottle caps. Caps, as they were shortened to, rose to become the accepted currency on the west coast with the creation of the now major trading center known as the Hub. Backed by one standard measure of water, Hub merchants chose bottle caps as their desired bartering currency as the technology to manufacture them and paint them was thought to be mostly lost during the Great War. This also meant that there were a limited number of bottle caps in circulation, protecting the region's economy from inflation. It was foolproof. Mostly. And where bottle caps would eventually share the spotlight with other currencies, at least in the NCR and in Kaiser Legion territories, that is, on the other side of the country, the bottle cap was really the only recognized and widely accepted currency. On the East Coast, the rise of using bottle caps as a primary currency came about in an entirely different way. The East Coast adopted the bottle cap thanks to a promotion between Nuka-Cola Corp and the White Spring Resort in Appalachia. You see, in October 2077, to celebrate the limited release of Nuka-Cola's newest flavor, Nuka-Cola Quantum, Nuka-Cola Corp partnered with the prestigious White Spring Resort for a very interesting promotion. For the entire month of October, vendors throughout the White Spring were ordered to accept Nuka-Cola bottle caps as legal tender. And as the Great War would strike mid to late October, there would be no one left to manually put a stop to the automated vendor's promotion protocol. The robotic vendors of the White Spring would forever accept the Nuka-Cola bottle cap in exchange for goods. So, whenever a wastelander needed to top up on supplies, they would mosey on over to the White Spring and trade their rummaged caps in exchange for whatever they needed. Soon, other merchants and wandering vendors would also accept caps in bartering trades. This pre-war Nuka-Cola White Spring partnership would set and determine the Eastern post-war economy. And just like that, Nuka-Cola's bottle cap was now more than just a worthless metallic lid in two of the most well-known sections of post-war America. And even outside of inadvertently inventing post-apocalyptic society's currency, Brad Burton's work lives on through the many wastelanders who drink, collect, and trade his magnum opus, the ever-so-sugary Nuka-Cola. Now, the next person on this list might be a bit more obscure, as they're only ever mentioned twice throughout the entire series. How does that work, you might ask? Well, 
It's easy to be considered one of the most influential pre-war characters in Fallout when you're the research head of the infamous Forced Evolutionary Virus Project. Leon Von Felden is designated as the lead researcher for Westech's Forced Evolutionary Virus Project. Now, before I get any further, attributing the creation of FEV to any one person is a bit of a doomed task. The project was being funded and overseen by the US military, so they share a good chunk of blame, and Von Felden had a whole team and support staff working alongside him, so they of course take some of that as well. So why did I choose to single out Von Felden versus people like Major Barnett or Robert Anderson, more people who are hardly mentioned in the games but played large roles in the creation of FEV? Well, one, scientists and other professions that conduct experiments are rigorously taught about research ethics, ethics committees, etc. A responsible researcher would know when and how to shut down a project when it was crossing an ethical threshold. And two, when you take on the role of being a leader, you become the one responsible for the actions that your team takes. If you disagree with my attribution of blame for the forced evolutionary virus, that's fine, we can agree to disagree, and honestly much of the script would still remain the same even if you subbed in someone else. With that being said, let's get into why Leon von Felden was one of the most influential pre-war people in Fallout. In response to rumors about China developing biochemical weapons to employ in the Sino-American conflict, the United States approved two projects. One of them was the Pan Immunity Virion Project, or PVP, and the other was Project Safehouse, and we'll get into that later. Anyway, the PVP was meant to act as a general immunity agent to be administered to America's population. However, when Batch 10-011 of the Pan Immunity Virion Project was created and its results were seen, this specific iteration of the Virion was renamed and a new project was born. Dubbed the Force Evolutionary Virus Project, a team of West Tech scientists, led by the previously mentioned Leon von Felden, were tasked with conducting experiments and research using the virus, with the hope of creating, well, super soldiers. This was supposed to be the next step in human evolution. Initial tests were performed on single-cell organisms in March 2075. The results were promising and exceeded expectations as the simple organisms showed signs of increased immunity to infection and radiation. As the months passed, the FEV team would gradually progress to performing tests on more complex creatures. After single-celled organisms, they experimented on flatworms, then white mice. In all cases, a notable increase in size, intelligence, and disease resistance was observed. The final experiment using batch 10-011 saw 218 rabbits being infected with FEV. Again, an increase in size was noted, but something a bit more concerning came about as well. The male mice were noted as being particularly aggressive. A peculiar side effect, surely nothing to be concerned about. In January 2076, a military unit was assigned to Westec in the interest of national security. We'll get to more on this later. This also marked the time that Von Felden and his team were experimenting with a new batch, dubbed Batch 11-011. The first experiment included the infection of several raccoons. Again, after infection, these raccoons grew in size and showed an increase in intelligence and manual dexterity. It was also around this time that West Tech's East Coast branch joined in on the forced evolutionary project, aiding in the research in order to push the virus to its limits. Back on the West Coast, new gene sequences would end up being spliced into batch 11-011 at the orders of the project's military overseer, Major Barnett. This version of FEV would be known as batch 11-011A. 23 dogs were exposed to this version, and all saw nearly immediate growth. The increase in size came with an increase in aggressiveness, but oddly enough, no increase to intelligence. Again, the genes from this experiment were to be spliced again, creating batch 11-111. This would be employed to infect over a dozen chimpanzees, and these results were unprecedented. Extreme increase in size and immunity to radiation and chemical agents was observed. However, two of the 15 subjects suffered from violent epileptic seizures and passed away. But this was enough for Major Barnett to relocate Von Felden and his staff from the West Tech Research Facility to the Mariposa military base. It was around this time too that Vault 87 in Washington DC was established as an independent research center. It was at the military base that Von Felden's project would be fully realized. Using batch 11-111, better known now as FEV2, prisoners of war would be exposed to the virus. And the result was exactly what Barnett and the military was wanting. Finally, powerful super soldiers could be mass produced. But it wasn't only the super mutants that were being created either. With FEV now being produced and stored at three major locations, a wide assortment of mutants were born from the green mixture. 
These beasts are the same lethal creatures, or at least the offspring from them, that roam the wastes today, posing as deadly threats to the average wastelander. Von Felden's work and research would affect countless generations of the post-apocalyptic population. Wars would be had over the virus. It's kind of crazy to think how much impact a character that was only mentioned twice in-game has on the Fallout universe. Next is the man who ended up killing Leon Von Felden, and just about every scientist that originally worked on the FEV project. Captain Roger Maxson was a member of the United States Armed Forces. A once decorated American soldier would end up betraying his country, killing several civilians in the process, and end up forming one of the longest lasting and widespread post-war factions, the Brotherhood of Steel. When West Tech managed a breakthrough during their Pan Immunity Virian project, Captain Maxson, along with several others, under the command of Colonel Robert Spindle, were assigned to act as security for the FEV research team. Spindle, Maxson, and the other squadmates would escort the FEV research team when it was ultimately moved from West Tech to the Mariposa military base. It was here that Maxson started to realize that things were not all hunky-dory. On October 10th, 2077, several soldiers part of the security detail discovered that the FEV research team was performing human experiments on military prisoners. Seemingly shocked by this news, Colonel Spindle had a nervous breakdown, locking himself in his office. This would leave Maxson in charge. Sympathizing with the horrors of war, many of Maxson's comrades called for blood. In response, Maxson ordered every scientist to be interrogated. He would figure out exactly what was going on, and who was responsible. On October 13th, 2077, Maxson writes in his diary, I killed a man today. I was interrogating Chief Scientist Anderson, and he was giving me the full details of their inhumane experiments. He said his orders came from the government, but I didn't buy it. He started screaming about how he was following orders and how he was a military man, and I just shot him. I tell myself it was to keep him from causing a full mutiny among the men, but I'm not so sure. During one of the interrogations, Maxson shot and killed a scientist after refusing to believe the man's story. Maxson then told himself it was to stop a mutiny, blood for blood. But unbeknownst to him at the time, the Mariposa mutiny had already begun, and it was far from over. Two days later, Colonel Spindle would, in Maxson's own words, blow his head off. Right before he pulled the trigger, he said he was sorry. Another round of interrogations began, but even to Maxson he knew that these were just glorified executions. One by one, scientists would be brought to Maxson. Maxson would demand to know who was responsible for these inhumane experiments. Every time, the scientists would say they were following orders from the government, and every time, Maxson would execute them. On October 20th, Maxson reached out to the outside world over radio for the first time. He declared himself and his team to be deserters from the army and succeeded from the United States. Maxson and his team were now officially traitors. But where Maxson expected another unit of soldiers to come and arrest his men, or outright execute them, he was instead met with silence. What was going on? It wouldn't take long for Maxson to figure out why he was so low on the government's to-do list, as only three days later, during an interrogation with Leon von Felden, atomic hellfire would rain from the sky, obliterating society as we know it. And like all the other scientists before him, von Felden wouldn't survive the interrogation. After burying the scientist to ease his own mind, Maxson opted to abandon the Mariposa military base along with its atrocities and take his men and their families to an old government bunker at Lost Hills. It would be here that Maxson would contact other military units across the country, including Elizabeth Taggarty's Taggarty's Thunder, and try to convince them to join his cause. In a proclamation to his men, Maxson stated that the United States government had failed its citizens and that a new order must be formed to preserve civilization. That order would be the Brotherhood of Steel. So while I know that technically the Brotherhood of Steel is a post-war faction, the idea for it came after Maxson witnessed the horrors associated with the forced evolutionary virus project, and technically Roger Maxson was around pre-war, thus making him a pre-war character. Checkmate. Captain Roger Maxson's Brotherhood would become a capable paramilitary force with several chapters scattered across much of the post-war United States. They would play significant roles in many wasteland-shaping conflicts. This included the Brotherhood Enclave War, Brotherhood Vipers Conflict, the War of the Commonwealth, NCR Brotherhood War, and the Unity Crisis. All because one military captain learned the truth about what the government was up to, and more specifically, how they allowed sickening human experiments to happen. But little did Captain Roger Maxson know, this wasn't the end of experiments on humans that were being funded by the US government. Dr. Stanislaus Braun was a talented scientist hailing from a small town in Germany, 
At some point, Braun moved to the United States where he would take on the role as the director of vault Societal Preservation Program. In 2054, the United States government proposed a contract to have several large nuclear fallout shelters built under U.S. soil. This was in response to a nationwide scare after three major events occurred at the turn of the decade. One, the war between the European Commonwealth and several Middle Eastern countries saw limited nuclear exchanges. Two, the new plague became so widespread that a national quarantine was mandated in 2053. And three, global discourse became non-existent after the United Nations was disbanded in July 2052. Americans were scared of what was yet to come. They wanted security. They wanted protection. And so, as I mentioned before, the US government put out a bid to several defense contractors. And when the government saw what one company, vault had built near their headquarters in Los Angeles, the contract was awarded to them. vault Industries was now in charge of keeping the American people protected in the event of nuclear devastation. But what the American public didn't know was how doomed they truly were. At some point, Project Safe House, or the Societal Preservation Project, was taken over by the shadow government now known as the Enclave. Rather than to be humanity's last hope for survival, they would instead become a sick and twisted playground for Stanislaus Braun's sickening experiments. 17 of the 122 known public vaults were designed to act as control vaults and operate as intended. The rest would have diabolical experiments associated with them. Whether it be to study the effects of isolationism or were intentionally overcrowded, the unlucky dwellers would be subjected to vault techs and the Enclave's sick games. And in control of vault tech side of this sinister plot was none other than Dr. Stanislaus Braun. These fallout shelters would end up serving a multitude of purposes in post-war America. Some were of course still in operation, conducting whatever experiment behind their gear-shaped doors. But others had opened up, letting the surviving former dwellers breathe in the harsh tang of post-fallout air. An injection of people were added to the wasteland. Some would survive and set up prosperous settlements, others suffered, falling victim to their own naivety. And some were abandoned outright, destined to be refitted and taken over by people just looking for a place to stay. Others serve as a great source to scavenge pre-war technology and loot. To say the vaults left a lasting mark on the wasteland would be an understatement. But Braun's pre-war legacy wasn't only limited to the vaults, no. You see, Dr. Braun was also credited as the sole developer of the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, or GEC. The Garden of Eden Creation Kit was touted as the newest and most advanced in survival technology. Packaged into a silver briefcase, the GEC was intended to be part of every vault's standard equipment list, though it's known that not every vault actually received one. The device was described as a self-contained terraforming module capable of creating and sustaining life in a post-nuclear environment. vault Tech even claimed it could fertilize some areas of the moon. Every GEC included seed and soil supplements, a fusion power generator, matter energy replicators, atmospheric chemical stabilizers, and water purifiers. The replicator was advertised as being capable of creating food and basic building materials. If you had one of these bad boys, you were set up for successful post-war living. The desire to acquire one of these unique and compact advanced pieces of technology would end up playing a significant role in the stories of two wasteland legends, that being the Chosen One and the Lone Wanderer. The Chosen One needed a Gek to save their village as they had just recently witnessed the worst dry season in years and the tool would help with crop growth. The Lone Wanderer needed a Gek in order to get Project Purity fully functional as the device could help with the purification of the Potomac River. If the Gek were never invented, who knows how the Chosen One and Lone Wanderer would have turned out. So despite Stanislaus Braun being alive and kicking, well, maybe not kicking, but he is being kept alive through Vault 112's stasis pods. Um, Anyway, despite Braun still being alive by the year 2277 and the start of Fallout 3, his contributions prior to the Great War put him on this list and make him one of Fallout's most influential pre-war people. This last one shouldn't really come as a surprise. Again, like Stanislaus Braun, despite Robert House still being kept alive 200 some odd years later, we're going to be talking about his pre-war accomplishments that ended up shaping the wasteland. And unsurprisingly, that comes in the form of his contributions to the field of robotics. Robco Industries was founded in 2042 by one Mr. Robert House. Almost immediately, Robco became one of the most powerful corporations in pre-war America. He accomplished this by pairing his aggressive expansion efforts along with his cutting-edge technologies. This allowed the company to secure near monopolies on certain aspects of the tech market. Robco Industries Unified Operating System, or UOS, 
became the industry standard in computing, and later RobCoS would become the standard operating system for security systems, being seen in many buildings as turret control system interfaces. In the field of robotics, Robco manufactured several commercial bots including the iBot, Protectron, and SentryBot. These bots were only rivaled by General Atomics International's own line of robotic beings. But where some rivalries would result in corporate espionage and the likes, Robco and GAI would work together with one another, advancing the field of robotics together. For example, early editions of the Mr. Handy was a crude bot reliant on extensive programming. But by the 2070s, with help from Robco Industries, the multi-purpose bot was now capable of advanced machine learning, able to perform even the most complicated of tasks. But this wasn't their only partnership either. Their most prestigious adventure was known as Military Contract 38917. Together, the two companies were charged with making the most powerful combat robot in the history of warfare. The goal was to use this hulking bot to not only liberate Alaska, but also demoralize the enemy and create cool propaganda pieces. You know, the huge. However, the project would be delayed indefinitely as they were unable to develop a suitable power source that could power all the bot's systems as well as remain compact enough for mobility purposes. Just working on and developing Liberty Prime alone would be a significant enough contribution to be considered one of the most influential people in the Fallout universe. Liberty Prime was used in two region-altering battles, the Battle for Project Purity and the War of the Commonwealth. But there's more to Robert House's pre-war legacy. Many rogue bots that roam the wastes are thanks to Robco's doing. Many non-rogue bots that are still operating centuries after the Great War are also thanks to Robco. Every model of the Pip-Boy that is worn by Vault Dwellers was created by Robco Industries. The Stealth Boy was thanks to a Robco scientist. The Assaultron, iBot, Protectron, and SentryBot all exist thanks to Robert House. Heck, the man even managed to save Las Vegas from assured destruction thanks to his missile defense system atop the Lucky 38. Whether they've heard the name or not, Robert House has affected nearly every post-war wastelander to ever exist. And that is my list of the 5 most influential pre-war Fallout characters. These are people from a time long gone that, unknowingly or not, have had the greatest influence with how Fallout's wasteland has turned out. You know, for better or for worse. And that's all from me today folks, if you liked the video be sure to share and subscribe. I know that there are more than just these 5 so maybe I'll make a part 2 in the future. Leave your suggestions in the comments. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. As we break bread together, let us forge, together, something new, something strong, something we can be proud of, something we can build upon. We'll preserve what's best of what's come before us and use it. And one day, we will reclaim what was lost. Let us forge a brotherhood of steel.